Yu-Gi-Oh! is a complicated game. You wouldn't expect a game that came from a children's TV show to have as much depth as it does. But with its long card text and tens of thousands of cards to play with, Yu-Gi-Oh! has stood out as one of the most difficult TCGs to get a grasp of. And with this much depth comes rules. And boy, does Yu-Gi-Oh! have a lot of rules. But not all rules existed since Yu-Gi first summoned Dark Magician. Some of these rules were added or changed due to players thinking they had outsmarted the game itself. So here are five times Yu-Gi-Oh! players had a hand in official tournament rules being changed. In the year of 2007, Upper Deck Entertainment, the company that ran tournaments before Konami did, announced the German National Championship. Two fedora-wielding individuals walked in with a 2,222 card deck. Everybody's heads turned as these two individuals walked up to the front desk with their 2,222 card deck and slapped down a deck list with over 100 pages and say, we would like to enter the tournament. Now you would think, how does one even play with a 2,222 card deck? Well, you see, they built this huge contraption that they used in order to stack their deck onto it without it falling over and allowed the player to get ready to duel. You would think, why? Why would any player want to show up with a 2,222 card deck? Well, the players didn't show up to try and win the tournament. What? They were actually two judges that wanted to get a rule changed. Per the rules at the time, their deck was fully allowed to enter the tournament. So with their huge contraption ready to go, they sat down at their first round, and would you believe, they built their deck not to be optimal or to try and win, they actually built their deck with a bunch of cards that all forced the deck to be shuffled. The entire plan was that because their deck was so large, every time they would need to shuffle, it would take borderline hours to shuffle the deck entirely, even a single time, to the point where it would be randomized enough for the deck to be legal to present to the opponent and continue the duel. At one point, one of the tournament organizers went up to them and kindly asked them if they would drop out of the tournament. They understood that what the players were doing wasn't against any of the rules, but it was actually impeding on the tournament for the rest of the players, and the players respectfully agreed. Roughly a year after this event, Konami actually implemented a deck size limit, and players can now play with anywhere between 40 and 60 cards in their deck, and we have these two individuals to thank. On March 7th of 2015, ARG Fort Lauderdale was taking place. Now, for those of you that are unaware of what an ARG is, it's an unofficial series of tournaments that was run by a store called Alter Reality Games, hence ARG. On this day at ARG Fort Lauderdale, Patrick Hoban, one of the best players in the world at the time, was a reigning national champion, was playing Necroz, which is a ritual deck that was considered to be the best deck of the format, but he was playing something a little bit special in his deck. Now, to understand the card that uh, Patrick Hoban was playing, you need to understand the concept of Floodgates. Floodgates are types of cards that basically do not allow the opponent to play a certain type of card. In his deck, Patrick Hoban was playing Jin Releaser of Rituals, and Jin Releaser of Rituals basically made it so that any ritual monster that was ritual summoned using the Jin as a material would prevent your opponent from special summoning anything while that ritual monster remains on the field. Now, Jin Releaser of Rituals wasn't a hidden card by any means. Pretty much every Necros player in the room had it in their deck, so Patrick Hoban and his team came up with an idea. His plan was as follows. Anytime he would play against a Necros player in a mirror match, he would offer to his opponent when side decking to side out the Jins. The way a gentleman's agreement like this would typically work Huzzah! is both players would agree to side out a specific card, they would take it out of their deck and place it on the side face up so that the opponent could very visibly and clearly see that that card was in fact sided out. Now here is where things get a little dicey. Mr. Hoban had a second copy of Jin Releaser of Rituals in his side deck. So should anyone take him up on the gentleman's agreement to side out the singular copy of Jin, Patrick Hoban would take the second copy of Jin that he has in his side, put it in his deck so that he was the only player playing with a copy of Jin Releaser of Rituals. They might have a chance. 
Yeah. Yep. And there they go, agreeing to side out the uh, the gins. Now, when doing research, it actually turns out this never worked. I think they're uh, both X2. They're both X2. Yeah. Yep. With that being said, a lot of players were arguing about whether or not this should even be allowed in the first place. A very recent update that happened in the past couple of years actually implemented an entire category about gentlemen's agreements. The primary reason why this isn't allowed per the rules is because Konami doesn't want any player to reveal any form of private information, and removing a card from your deck face up does reveal private information, but there's a very strong possibility that this rule was actually changed because of this Patrick Hoban Jin story being as popular as it was. And for that reason, this rule has been changed ever since, and this is not allowed anymore. Moving on to something a little bit more technical. This is less so a play that happened by a single player and more so a play that happened by the entirety of the player base. So certain cards in Yu-Gi-Oh have effects that allow you to attempt to guess a card from your opponent's hand, guess a card that's in your opponent's deck in order to do a specific action. Now it's important to note before we move on that Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't have any fail to find rules and previously any card that would make you guess a card out of your opponent's hand or guess a card out of your opponent's deck required a verification. So for example, if I'm activating Ordeal of a Traveler and my opponent needs to guess what type of card is in my hand, if they select a card and then they call spell, I would have to show them the card in order to reveal to them whether or not it is a spell. This led to a very interesting scenario where certain cards actually had bonus effects that weren't written on the card. And the most important card for this situation is Mind Crush. Mind Crush is a very powerful card that allows you to declare a card, and if your opponent has that card or multiple copies of that card in their hand, they need to discard that copy or those copies of that card. Now, the reason this influenced Mind Crush a lot is specifically because Mind Crush would have the additional bonus effect that if your opponent had the card or didn't have the card in their hand, they would need to reveal their entire hand to prove to you that they do not have that copy or that they do not have multiple copies if they've only discarded a single copy of the card. Because of how much this buffed Mind Crush, Mind Crush was a card that was in so many player side decks, it was everywhere. There were a lot of players at the time that were advocating for Mind Crush to get banned because of this. And Konami actually listened, and on April 3rd of 2019, they pushed out a tournament policy update changing the entirety of the hand and deck verification rules. Another facet of the hand and deck verification rule was the fact that if I activate a card such as Reinforcement of the Army, thinking that I had a warrior monster in my deck, and I actually picked up my deck and didn't have a warrior monster at all, I would have to hand my deck to my opponent for them to verify that I actually do not have a legal search. So the new update that they made to the hand and deck verification rules actually changed a lot. It made Mind Crush significantly weaker and removed the entire deck verification in general. So basically what the new rule was, was if you declared a card such as Mind Crush and you declared a card in their hand, they would simply discard or not discard and you would not verify their hand. You would simply need to trust that your opponent is not lying. I'm gonna take you guys back on a little bit of a trip down memory lane. Upper Deck Entertainment ran tournaments known as Shonen Jump Championships, or SJCs, with rules that were kind of different to those that we have today. Official tournaments were always played with time rules, but the way those time rules were handled back in the day was very unique. Nowadays, matches can end in a draw under certain circumstances, but back in the early 2000s during SJCs, a match could not end in a draw and a winner needed to be determined at all times. So there were a couple of players at the time that studied these end of match rules and determined that there were a couple of flaws that were very exploitable. And those rules that are very exploitable are the following. One, a match cannot end until a player has won two duels in a match. If a duel ends in a draw, you simply proceed to the next duel and whoever chooses who goes first in the previous duel chooses again. And two, if time is called during a match, whoever has the highest life point total after four turns would win the current duel. So with these flaws in mind, these players came up with a perfect strategy to take advantage of these end of match procedures. 
A deck centered around the card Self-Destruct Button, a card whose sole purpose was to cause duels to end in a draw. So their strategy was simple. Utilize Self-Destruct Button alongside cards that set your life points really low, such as Wall of Revealing Light, in order to force duels to end in a draw over and over and over again until the round's timer has ended. To compare this with today's procedure, if enough duels end in a draw, the match will be determined to be a draw. Now you might be wondering how these players would win if all they're doing is causing draws. Right before the timer runs out, these players would side deck out of their self-destruct button strategy and side in cards that increase their life points or lower their opponent's life points in order to win via the end of match time procedures, rather than by reducing their opponent's life points to zero. And the reason why this strategy worked is that per the time rules at the time, once the timer is over and the time rules are called, players are no longer allowed to side deck, meaning that these players will swap into their strategy right before the timer is called and the opponent cannot swap their strategy to take advantage of the time rules and win in time. Now you might be thinking, Yu-Gi-Oh is no stranger to strategies intended to cheese out wins, so why would this cause any sort of rule change? There's actually two logistical issues with decks like these. Count em, two. As we know, Konami doesn't like it when outside factors begin playing a part in a player winning or losing a match. The end of match procedures exist to make it so rounds don't go for unbelievably long, not for someone to basically stall the match all the way to time in order to essentially unlock a new win condition. And the second reason is that a deck like this could realistically continue to cause draw after draw after draw, even after the round time has ended, resulting in everyone in the room needing to wait on the conclusion of a single match for the next round to begin. Now, while there's no direct proof that this deck is the reason why Yu-Gi-Oh! tournaments later ended up allowing for matches to end in a draw, there are many reasons that point to that being the case. There's even a little bit of speculation that Upper Deck's tournament software simply didn't allow the option to mark a match's result as a draw, and that this was only changed once Konami took over from Upper Deck in 2009 and added the draw option to the tournament software. So let me know what you guys think. Do you think they added draws because of this deck, or do you think it was just something they had to implement? If you're interested in more details about how this strategy worked, there's actually an entire thread on Pojo detailing exactly how to play this deck I'll leave a link to that in the description if you're interested in looking at it. In card games, sometimes you have trolls that find loopholes in the rules to do something funny, but others find loopholes to help them win in unconventional ways. In Yu-Gi-Oh, there are some rare instances where card effects can loop infinitely and the way those are handled has changed over the years. In order to understand this rule change, we need to understand two concepts, a controlled loop as well as the concept of an uncontrolled loop. A controlled loop is essentially a loop where a player has multiple effects that they can just choose to activate in any sequence or order that would loop infinitely. An example of this would be if a player finds some way to make their Gale Dogra a psychic type monster, they can equip telekinetic charging cell to it and basically allow for the not once per turn effect of Gale Dogra to be used an infinite amount of times. Now how would you loop this? You can use Gale Dogra to send a monster from your extra deck to the graveyard, and then use Gale Dogra again to send Cyframe Lord Omega from your extra deck to the graveyard, and then use the Cyframe Lord Omega to return itself and the first extra deck card that were sent back to your extra deck. This causes one perfect infinite loop that basically can be activated by the player as often as they would like. The way controlled infinite loops are handled is that if a player has a loop such as the Gale Dogger loop that I represented here, they can basically perform it once to prove that it is an infinite loop that can be done again and again, and then they simply tell their opponent how many times they wish to reproduce the loop, and then afterwards they need to just continue with the game and do something else. So those loops are actually totally fine and completely allowed in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! A lot of decks such as Six Samurai utilize infinite loops. It actually doesn't add a lot of time to the game itself because you can just declare how many times you want to do it and then perform it that number of times. Now on the opposite hand, there are uncontrolled loops and uncontrolled loops are named that way specifically because they are caused by a bunch of continuous effects applying at the same time in a way that they constantly apply and reapply and reapply in a way where the game cannot continue because these effects are constantly reapplying. 
So an example of an uncontrolled loop is say I control a copy of Jinzo that belongs to my opponent that I stole with my own copy of Snatch Deal. This Jinzo would be equipped with my opponent's amplifier. If I activate Imperial Order, the following would occur. The Imperial Order would apply, negating my Snatch Deal, making it so that my opponent takes back their Jinzo. But now because they control their Jinzo while they have Amplifier, my Snatch Deal will now reapply because the Imperial Order gets negated by the Jinzo, making it so the Jinzo returns to my side of the field. But now because it's on my side of the field, my Snatch Deal is now negated by the Imperial Order and returns to my opponent's side of the field, and so on and so forth in an infinite loop that cannot be stopped by any means because these are a sequence of continuous effects that continue to apply and stop applying and reapply and stop applying and reapply and stop applying and reapply and stop applying and reapply. Now I know what you're thinking. Coder, there's no way this happens even remotely often in tournaments or anything like that. And you know what? You'd be right. Correct. The most famous instance of this actually occurred on my stream. At one point, I was taking judge calls on Dueling Book and I hopped into a call where a player had a very interesting board setup. So in this judge call, what happened is that the player in question controlled and invoked Purgatrio, a monster that gains 200 attack for every single card on the opponent's side of the field. They also controlled a monster that had 2700 attack that was also equipped by Phoenix Blade, which would buff its attack up to 3000. However, there was also a pole position on the field. A card that says that the monster on the field with the most attack is unaffected by spell effects. So currently they control the Purgatrio at 26 and the Battle Shogun at 27. The Battle Shogun is equipped with a spell card, but it's currently unaffected by that spell card. So it's not receiving the attack buff from that Phoenix Blade. In this very particular instance, anytime the opponent would so much as place a card on the field, it would cause the Purgatrio's attack to go from 26 to 28, making it so that the Battle Shogun is now no longer unaffected by the Phoenix Blade, so the Battle Shogun's attack will go up to 3000, making it the monster on the field with the most attack, making it so pole position renders that monster unaffected by the Phoenix Blade, so it go back down to 27, but then the Purgatrio still has 2800 attack, so now the Battle Shogun is once again affected by the Phoenix Blade, basically rendering it illegal per the game rules for the opponent to so much as place a card on the field. Now I posted this judge call to my YouTube channel and it blew up. Other content creators such as MBT Yu-Gi-Oh made some videos about this as well. Seriously, why? I'm playing a combo deck whose win condition is calling a judge over to your table and it doesn't work online. Now again, Konami doesn't actually explain why they change certain rules or why they make updates to the tournament policy, but coincidentally, the next tournament policy that occurred literally a year after this video went up, Konami changed the rules to infinite loops that are uncontrolled. Initially, what the rules were is that it was illegal to make a play that would cause an uncontrolled infinite loop to begin. However, post the new policy update, they actually changed the rules to make it so that if an uncontrolled loop is caused in any way, shape, or form, a judge is to be called and the judge will determine which of the cards currently on the field is the most responsible for causing the infinite loop and that card will immediately be sent to the graveyard so as the loop stops and the duel can continue. Let me know in the comment section below if you like this type of video. This is the first video essay that I've done, and I'm genuinely really interested to do more of these. So if there's any topics in particular that you'd like me to cover, let me know in the comment section. I would love to hear your feedback on this video. And without further ado, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.